The time is, we're missing our secretary today. She's under the weather. So it's 7.33 for the record. Um, we're joined tonight by Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Superintendent Cummings, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Max and Canelli, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly, and our student representatives. I ask you to all please rise for the pledge. Ms. Jacobson, will you lead us in the pledge, please? right to it with our student reports. Awesome, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name's Aniket, and I'm your junior representative from Ludlow. Now, I wanna to begin tonight by collectively expressing on behalf of the student body our sadness that Mr. Cummings will be leaving us at the end of this year, but of course, we wish him well in his future endeavors, and we wanna shout out our principal, who is now Dr. Hatzis, after getting his doctorate in education, in education leadership with a focus on social emotional learning. In terms of student achievement, we have 13 students who made it to all states in orchestra and choir, and we have two students who won awards at the Connecticut Future Business Leaders of America competition, including Caden Dijon, who made it first place in economics, and Didip Singhu, who got fourth place in web design and won the Who's Who Award. Now, our drama club has been hard at work with their spring musical, The Wedding Singer, and we invite the entire Fairfield community co to come and watch it on April 29th through May 1st. It's a weekend in late April and early May. Opening night is the 29th, and there's gonna be shows at 7 p.m. on the Friday and the Saturday, and 2 p.m. on the Saturday and the Sunday. Now, last week was the return of Ludlow's legendary pep rallies, and we were Delighted to see a host of festivities like musical chairs. We celebrated our spring sports teams and got to see our amazing cheer team perform. And Ludlow is right now running a combined collection of staff, administration, and students as a Ukraine fundraiser. FLHS stands with Ukraine. We have had t-shirt sales. We're having a spike ball tournament. And there is going to be a walkout on April 28th. And our ultimate goal is to collect $20,000 to give to Save the Children, which is an organization on the ground in Ukraine helping out children with aid and food and medical supplies. And we are really excited to see the entire Fairfield community pitch into this really great initiative. Thank you. That's all from me. Over to Reed. Okay, hello everyone. As I'm sure you know by now, I'm Reed Childers. I'm your senior board of ed representative from Ludlow. The first thing I'd like to report on is our Eco Club. So although this sounds straight up out of a movie, last week many people questioned why some of our students were dressed up as utensils. This was because the FLHS Eco Club has been fundraising in order to bring awareness about the importance of using biodegradable utensils. Unfortunately, it does cost close to $2,000 per month to purchase enough biodegradable utensils for one school, but the Eco Club has raised $4,000 so far, as well as propelled conversations in the school about what each of us can do to be more sustainable. Secondly, I'd like to address the school climate survey that FLHS juniors and seniors took in school today. The intention behind the survey was to hear students' voices about all the positives and negatives of FLHS, so the students, teachers, and administrators know what to work on and what to keep going. Next, I'd like to give an individual shout out to one of our brilliant students, Harper Treshik, who has won some incredible awards for her journalism. Harper came in first place in the Connecticut Press Club's high school competition for several, uh, for several articles she wrote in Prospect, Ludlow's newspaper. She won first place for an opinion article and third place for a feature story while also scoring honorable mentions for two opinion pieces. Congratulations, Harper. The last topic relates to an event that I couldn't be more excited for. Existing before COVID-19 and formerly known as Project Runway, the PTA is sponsoring Falcon Fashion on Sunday, May 15th in the FLHS Auditorium. Seniors get to walk the runway and model clothing loaned from local stores. The event also includes student music groups, raffle baskets, and refreshments. As seniors walk, the MC, which will also be Principal Hatzis, reads a bio of their favorite things like favorite foods, memories, fun facts, etc. Past seniors always found this to be one of their favorite senior events, and as a senior myself, I can't wait to walk the runway before I graduate. That is all I have for you today, and thank you for your time.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the Fairfield Board of Ed. My name is Lynn Sonilla, and I'm a student representative for Fairfield Ward High School. This month, Fairfield Ward High School is extremely proud of our students for raising money for the Ukrainian refugees. And in addition, a special shout out to Fairfield Ward High School alumni, Emily Newman, class of 2011, for her incredible re efforts to aid uh, refugees from Ukraine. Emily lives in Germany and is helping the Ukrainian refugees fleeing the war by participating in relief convoys. Here at Fairfield Ward High School, we're extremely proud of you. Um, Emily, Emily, and finally, this month, students of Fairfield Ward High School donated their old AP and SAT books for their first annual Fairfield County Book Drive, um, and that was advertised by some of our National Honor Society members. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma Feckety, and I'm a student representative for Fairfield Ward High School. Starting off, two of our outstanding teachers, Mrs. Lutz and Ms. Mason, were selected for a Fund for Teachers Fellowship grant this year, and our student body congratulates them for receiving this prestigious grant as they grow professionally and continue to make Ward a better place. Additionally, congratulations to Andrew Fuller, a current sophomore who raised about $4,000 to purchase four AEDs to be located at the beaches of Fairfield. And congratulations to our very own Sneha Sunder, who is an achieving finalist standing in the 2022 National Merit Scholarship Program. Ward is extremely proud of you both. And this month at Fairfield Ward High School, we have had numerous lives after high school fairs, including the USA Fair um, on the March 30th in Southern Connecticut College and Gap Year Fair today. In addition, to open up options for the students at Fairfield Ward High School, we also welcome the following military branches to our school. The Army, the Air National Guard, the Army National Guard, the Coast Guard, the Marines, and the Navy. All these fairs ga uh, gave a huge variety of options for life after high school here at Ward. Finally, students are all working extremely hard for the upcoming AP exams after April break. And wrapping up, student elections for the classes of 2024 and 2025 have begun, and students who have an interest in running have started preparing for their elections. We are in the process of planning for our spring pep rally, of which will occur after spring break, and it will feature our sports teams and some fun competitions between students and staff. In sports, our track team won their first meet last week, and our baseball team is already off to a strong start as being ranked number one in the state after only the first week. With another game today at Berlin, which I actually just discovered they won, we anticipate another season, a great season of not only baseball, but the rest of our spring sports. Thank you for your time, and go Ward. <laughs> Thank you for your reports. Um, do board members have any questions for our students? Um, I heard Ludlow's musical. Is Ward doing a musical also? Do you know High School Musical? A bit. Yeah, we are. I'm actually not sure of the date, though. They're starting to work on it. Just want to give it a shout out to um, those performers as well. For anyone who's listening and is looking for something to do, two high school musicals for that weekend. Um, and I'm sure it'll be promoted in our local press. Thank you. You guys are welcome to stay. Of course, um, it's a beautiful night, so maybe you can get some, enjoy the warm weather as well. Um, or study for your AP exams, it sounds like. Okay, moving on to public comment. At this time, we invite members of the public to give comment on agenda items. It's three minutes per comment, and you are, we ask that you just give comment once on per agenda, agenda item. Okay. Seeing none, we are going to move on to a presentation of student achievement data. Um, the board, we flipped the classroom on this a little bit. The board received a, um, a video presentation of this data last week. It was posted with the agenda, so we had the opportunity to um, review it before the presentation tonight. Mr. Cummings, I don't know if you have any opening remarks on this. Hi, thank you. And just very briefly, and I'm going to have Dr. Rasmus and Dr. Savichensik and uh, Ms. Marte come up to the table. Uh, our intent tonight is, uh, I know that uh, some, we received some additional board uh, questions prior to tonight. Uh, we sent the board an update on what uh, responses to those questions. So our intent tonight is to begin um, with an overview of that handout and then um, using the presentation that you've already seen, really we'll go through that and see if there's any uh, further questions on the actual data that Dr. Rasmussen put together and shared with the board last week. Um, again, as we look at the data uh, and we talk about uh, where we are going as a school system. Um, we have just completed uh, the, Dr. Zavichancic, Dr. Parrish, 
Dr. Rasmussen, um, uh, Mr. Mancusi, and Ms. Marte, and myself attended um, the school improvement plan, school improvement uh, updates for all of our schools. Uh, Dr. Swingler joined us for this uh, middle school and high school meetings as well. And um, that, that takes about three or four weeks to complete. It's a two-hour meeting at least with each of the schools. But essentially what we go through is the school improvement plan that the schools implemented at the beginning of the year. We look for progress on that information. We review the data that's relevant to the level, whether it's the STAR data, the PSAT data. We also looked at attendance data. Um, and many of the ideas and questions that are, came up during the course of that meeting, Dr. Rasmussen has captured in his presentation. So we can talk further about that um, tonight as well, um, but I really want to turn this over and, and spend some time with the information. Uh, one last note, this is a follow-up to the information we presented in October, I believe it was, to the board. Um, and we had said at that time we'd give you a spring update, so this is that presentation. Floor is yours. Good evening, James Evajancic, Executive Director of Instruction, Curriculum, and Assessment, and I'm joined tonight, as Mr. Cummings said, by Dr. Rasmussen and Ms. Marte. Um, we are here to give a presentation on uh, some internal indicators, such as our universal screener, STAR, which uh, is administered K through 8, as well as some external secondary data uh, that we've had since our October presentation, including the PSAT and some qualitative information on school improvement planning. Um, that goes along with it. Ms. Uh, Dr. Rasmussen uh, will give a brief, broad overview, as well as um, we will go through the slides and answer any board questions that may have arisen. Uh, we'll also go through the additional data that um, is present today on some subgroup performance uh, that came about as a result of the initial data. So thank you for your time, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Rasmussen. <laughs> Dr. Rasmussen, um, Director of Secondary Math Student Achievement. Um, how I always like to start off, like, uh, like I, I presented through the data that I, uh, that I sent you guys last week, is we always want to talk about how data tells a story. Um, and what I'm going to go through tonight, I'm just going to highlight a few things, turn it over, ask additional questions from the data here, and then, uh, and then transition over to the additional data that was sent to you um, earlier today. So one of the things when we get into is start talking about data telling a story is we really want to kind of think about how does the data inform us, especially around the experiences of our students. And so when we get into this data, we really want to kind of capture that with that's that, um, that focus question of what is, it, how, what is the story that the data tells us really about those experiences of students. And I'm not going to go through every single um, kind of the slide, but ultimately I can look at the, the data that I provided you really kind of is in really three, uh, about five sections. One being the STAR assessment for math, um, the STAR assessment for, um, for reading, for also providing an overview in terms of how performance of our, our BOOST students did, and then kind of then transitioning over and looking at um, the PSAT uh, 10 and 11 results for math, and also the PSAT 10 results for, um, for evidence-based reading and writing. And I'm, I'm really going to kind of kind of go to some specific slides, that, uh, which I highlighted here, again, looking at the data that we, we looked at last fall. And what's this is really important to kind of, well, we, I recorded this video for you guys, but I also want to frame a lot of the big ideas that come out of for, for um, the people in the audience and also those watching, is seeing this, this is a slide, we're looking at the star reading by ethnicity. Um, again, by looking at, again, we have all students, 
our Hispanic Latino students, our, our Asian multi-race. And again, you, you will see, you'll see this, this, again, this big gap between our Hispanic and our, and our African American and black students compared to the other subgroups. Um, similarly, then when I go over to, to math, I see a similar um, um, performance gap um, as the, the STAR uh, assessment was administered from fall of 2019, winter 2020, and then kind of then transitioning over to the fall of, of 20 um, through, through, through the uh, administration we, that we just completed in January. Um, so really, I'm, I would like kind of I might turn it back over. Are there any questions related to the, the STAR in terms of looking at this, our achievement gap as we, uh, uh, um, relation even in, in reference to some of the data that we uh, presented to you in, in, in October? Um, I've asked this question a couple of times. I asked it last spring and then again in October, and I'm going to bring it up again tonight um, because what I don't see here is, um, or maybe I'm missing it, is our ninth graders. And some of them did take STAR testing, and that was something that was supposed to be reported back to the board last spring, and I waited for it, and it was not reported then or in the fall, and I don't see it here. And I'm particularly concerned about the students that um, were part of the, this transition time from middle school to high school during the COVID period. And I'm not seeing that picture reflected um, in really any of these reports. So um, even though we have data on you know, this limited number of, of STAR testing, I mean, I don't know if I saw the PSAT 8-9 results from our ninth graders. I don't see it in here, so I don't know where that is. And so it's hard for me to see like the progress of those students, and I'm particularly concerned um, in the areas of math um, when we look at the scores for our current tenth graders, who um, you know a lot of them were in algebra one in eighth grade when this broke down, um, and you know that that obviously has made a huge impact on their math um, opportunities or. So, um, you know, it's something I, I just keep repeating it, and I, I don't know what else to do, but um, it's a concern of mine. So I wanted to share that, and if there's more information you could give, I mean, maybe this is something that you're tracking carefully and, and it's already taken care of, but I, I haven't heard any updates about that. Thank you. Specifically to the star in um, ninth grade, um, th because of the, the change between administrations. Um, we do administer star in the, uh, the ninth grade English non-honors and also the, eight, uh, the ninth grade uh, in, in the algebra one. Um, we have, so it's, we are still, look, I mean, the data we get back is in, look, looks, we, it's a little bit in transition because we have like one or two years in terms of just those subgroups of students. Um, but then I, that's some data I can provide to you. That would be great because it's something we haven't seen. So now we have two entire cohorts of um, students that we're not really tracking their transition to high school. And I mean, we see the impact on our transition from elementary to middle school. We know that's enormous from the data you've seen, but we can't see it, or at least I can't see it from these reports. So it's something I understand that it's difficult because um, of the challenges just explained, but it's also not um, something that I've seen publicly. Thank you. Um, and also just to follow up on Mrs. Guernsey's point, uh, what about the PSAT 9 results? Did I miss that or are those in here? Those are not in, it was not part of this presentation. Um, and I have to ask why not? Oh, that, that, uh, we're still working through that. There's a, a little bit of a process. Um, it's, it's not something that I, I look into. We will, I can provide that, but it's, it wasn't provided in terms of, because it's a smaller window of time that we've actually administered it. But ultimately, I, that is something I can provide you with a little work that I would have to, to get that to you to how to break it down into the various subgroups. So, And I'm not clear on why that isn't available in the same timing as the grade 10 and grade 11. A lot of it goes to some of the difficulties between Navi how we usually get the PSAT 10 and 11, we actually downloaded into Naviance. It's a little, a little bit technical. Um, it's just something how we how we get it into. But we do have it overall by by the entire grade nine, but it's not broken down to subgroups specifically. But it, again, it's something that I can work on. 
um, if I want to get that data to you. Well, I guess because part of my point with that is not only to do the tracking, it's, it's a grade that's completely not reported on at all in this data, but that, of course, the other data question I had about this is how many of them have now fulfilled the graduation requirements? Um, so, yes, I, I would follow up on Mrs. Guernsey's request that we do get that PSAT 9 information so we know how we're doing. Um, additionally, I was wondering if we can now be more specific based on this data of what, and maybe this is too early, so if, if this is coming up later, but the nature of the Summer Boost Program, which last summer seemed like a, a wonderfully engaging experience, but for which we had no measurable academic goals. And so how is all of this data factoring into exactly what we are doing this summer to really target very specific learning loss? Again, I, I while I was disconcerted by the lack of ac academic targeting uh, last summer, I did absolutely embrace the whole notion of, you know, getting kids re-engaged in school. But this summer, I would, I would hope for more. So how is this shaping the program, and how is this shaping who will be invited? We can get you the specific indicators on how uh, students were invited uh, this year to each of the programs. Um, in terms of the curriculum, it's currently being, uh, I, I don't want to say re rewritten, but revised uh, based on what we learned last year from it. Um, in addition, we know that the staffing piece of it, for example, in math, and I'm sure Dr. Rasmussen can talk about this as well, um, in terms of teachers pushing into the classrooms uh, and those providing interventions to students, we could track a little better uh, with the program that we're devising now. Um, I think Dr. Parrish is going to talk to us about the invitations and, and qualifications. Zakia Parrish, Executive Director of Operations and Processes. In reference to, I, I know the middle school criteria was the exact same criteria that we used for the ARP ESSER after school program. So it was based on students meeting three out of five um, criteria. So it was based on STAR performance or SBAC performance. Um, it was based on attendance, teacher recommendation, and also their current grade. So it was looking at which students um, fell into uh, either um, approaching proficiency or below proficiency in either of those particular categories, those students were identified as being targeted for the BOOST program. And so that's who was the initial target group um, in terms of the invitations for the middle school. So they wanted to use similar criteria to what we're using for the after school program because we found that to be helpful in terms of really having a firm grasp of which students needed the additional supports. Okay, so that, and, and I, I understand the chart, and thank you for that answer, I appreciate that. But how will the nature of the program change? Has that, because obviously I assume you're gonna have to start recruiting staff for this, like yesterday. <laughs> I'm not telling you, I mean, obviously you already know that, but because this obviously is going to be very different from the after-school program, which I think was very directly, here's what you're doing in class right now, here's how we can support that. Not necessarily for the after-school. That wasn't all it was. And, and that, true. Obviously, you know, there, there was a, the component of mentoring um, and supporting them in a variety of ways. True. But now we have data about learning loss. We have data about grades not measuring up to prior groups. We know that there is a learning loss. So, what are, and, and, and I'm not saying you have the answer now, but when will we hear specifically about what are we doing for those students to get them up to where they are expected to be based on the curriculum we've passed? So the curriculum administrators and curriculum, uh, the curriculum administrators and the program principals have been working on revising the, the programming that was used last summer, as Dr. Zavajancic mentioned. So they're looking at the units that were delivered, specifically for the middle school, looking at a way to really uh, strengthen the, the mathematics part of the program, um, providing additional supports, pretty similar to what's provided during the school day in terms of the MRT, Magnet Resource Teacher, pushing into those sections to provide additional targeted supports in the area of mathematics. So that's what's happening in terms of looking at the test scores, they've identified that math is definitely an area of concern and that's where a lot of the, uh, the bulk of the additional support are going to be put into that area. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and then just You're one welcome. last question. Um, obviously, in terms of the achievement gap, uh, the one thing to me that's very striking, both from just looking at the numbers and looking at the colorful images, which help, uh, is that we're rising and falling together as a district. When every, when, when the, uh, you know, our minority students are performing better, it's corresponding to what, how everybody is doing better. The point is that what we are doing as interventions in the classroom and how we're examining our instructional practices, it's achieving improvement for everyone, but the gap is there in second grade. So my question to you, and not like this isn't the, the I'm asking you for the silver bullet that the entire nation is listening to your answer right now, but what is the plan for Fairfield Public Schools for kindergarten and first grade? Because unless we address that, asking a ninth grade teacher to compensate for something that we knew in the second grade, is, it's not a fair request, and it's not a way to, to operate. So I'm hoping you can speak to that. There's a number of things uh, we're looking at in foundational skills K to two. So I'll uh, speak of reading first, um, but math is no outlier as you notice here. Um, in reading, we recognize that there's a need for foundational reading skills. Those include things we've spoken about at the board table before. Um, students coming to us, um, Delving into phonemic awareness, for example, recognizing um, the language skills they need, phonics instruction K2, it's uh, all the way into second grade at this point with the cohort, the first cohort that's gone through. Uh, we also know that with the curriculum, we have to address things like uh, building background knowledge. Um, with that being said, that's you know sort of the content piece, but all of this has to happen in a synergistic way. So building those foundational skills while also addressing background knowledge as well as liter literacy skills. Um, and this goes beyond our, our reading block in K2, uh, as well as in uh, 3.8. I mean, you mentioned ninth grade, uh, but it goes all the way, all the way throughout. Um, we are looking to see gains. As you know, the um, principals, the literacy coaches this year have gone through the foundational training with Literacy How on those foundational skills. Uh, we do want to integrate that into our curriculum review moving forward, uh, as well as uh, look at what currently works and what's not working in terms of what content and skills are being addressed uh, in that. Um, I would say math is in a similar pursuit um, in terms of conceptual knowledge and having uh, students know both, obviously, their fluency patterns uh, in fact, recall, but we have to move beyond that, that they also know the conceptual understanding of sort of how numbers and, and math works as well. So in a similar vein to the reading, it has to be a synergistic uh, move to learn content and skills uh, in a way. In math, it's a little more linear than language arts, um, but we are, the language arts curriculum review is moving forward. Uh, I would say the the big stuff is the phonemic awareness, the phonics, and then building a curriculum that builds off of itself moving forward in a standardized way. Thank you, thank you. I, Mike Cummings, Superintendent. I just want to add to that a um, couple thoughts. Uh, one, uh, you know, as you, as you know from a preview from um, earlier in the year when we gave an initial iteration of the district improvement plan, the next five year district improvement plan, one of our core goals of that is um, that every student will finish grade two reading um, at grade level. And that is, um, that's, that's something that we as a district have to strive to because as you rightfully point out, Ms. Maxicanelli, if that gap exists early, that gap is really much more difficult to close in ensuing years. And you're, you're working from a deficit model than from a strengths model. Um, but I also wanna point out that when you look at our data, there are places after grade two where that opportunity gap widens, where, because it's even getting every student reading at grade level at the end of grade two, it's still incumbent on the ensuing grades to maintain that growth, to maintain that level of achievement um, all the way up through graduation. And if you take a look at our data, there are places where we retreat. And part of the work that we've been doing in these school improvement play, uh, meetings with the staff, with the administrators, is to identify where and why those things are happening. And I would tell you that I think one of the root issues that we face is um, a culture of expectations. 
And as you point out, it, when our achievement rises, in a sense, all students, all students essentially benefit. But what we don't do when we think about our subgroups, um, if they're already behind, whether it's whether we're thinking of subgroups by ethnicity or free and reduced lunch or special education, EL students, what we don't do is we don't accelerate their growth to close the gap. So for students who are behind a year, in order to finish that current school year on grade level, they have to make up two years, right? And that's what we're not good at doing yet. Uh, we see pockets of achievement, we see pockets of growth, and I would tell you that I, finishing these meetings, I felt really encouraged by what I was hearing from the buildings, but um, we're not yet at a place where we have a prevalent culture that says that when I come to work, I can make this difference, and that it's on me to make this difference. And so that, I think, is all the curricular work, and that's all important, but without the belief statement from that behind for our staff, and honestly, too, from the community, then we'll continue to struggle. Thank you so much uh, for that answer. Um, and so th that's it for me, except, oh shoot, what was the other thing I was gonna ask? Um, and of course, Dr. Zavjensik, you know I love that answer. Um, uh, that's what I wanted to check with, um, you know, in terms of the pairing. Do we have any more word from the state in terms of the ELA curriculum? And is anything that you're hearing making you think that it won't work well with what we're attempting to do in the district improvement plan? Uh, there is, I, I've heard of nothing new in terms of them picking, I think what you're asking is have they picked the essentially five or more programs uh, that they're anticipated to. Uh, they have not. The last uh, check-in with them, they were hiring the literacy director for that state arm of the uh, Department of Education uh, who will lead this. Um, and in the meantime, they've been doing, um, I believe it was Hanover Research who has been doing a research review of programs. Um, as you know, there's other reports out there on them. So uh, we're waiting for that for by July 1. Um, we do. They do talk about the science of reading um, and what that means to them, but they've not, they've not laid their stakes for us yet in terms of where we're going. Where's my chair? Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this presentation and all the uh, work that went into this. Um, I don't want to jump ahead too much because I know you have other things to present, um, Mr. Rasmussen, so I'm not going to get into going forward yet. Um, I know you have this slide up here, but I was looking more at the grade um, slides. Um, and I just wanted to first acknowledge, you know, how much growth has happened since we've, you know, the pandemic and, and, and the areas that have moved this year, obviously. Um, I also wanted to point out that I feel like although our elementary kids seem to be rebounding a little bit quicker here, um, I'm not seeing the same pace at which middle school and going into high school is. So is there any insight as to possibly why that may be the case um, or just an acknowledgement of, of that being the case and how we're addressing that for them? I can uh, speak specifically for math. I mean, yeah, again, the, the, the data shows that really the, the, the students in, in the, the, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth have struggled the most in mathematics. And that's something that we continue to work on and we'll look to support through our, our interventionists. They're working amazingly hard, working with teachers to, uh, to support the students to be successful in our current grade level curriculum. We, to me, the, the best way is to keep the expectations high, keep the same curriculum, and support them up to be successful. And that ultimately, that, that's the best approach to help closing the gap. Um, and, and ultimately, that, that's where we want to be, and that's where we're going to continue to work. And that, that's the same mindset when we're working with our, our, our tier one interventions with our cl uh, core classroom teachers to our interventionists that work um, day and night to kind of support those students throughout. So it, it is constant work, and that's why I, I think we're we're making progress, and I think yeah, can you see, especially in towards the, the later grades, even all the grades, we're seeing that ticks up, especially from the uh, the fall to the winter. Okay, thank you. I just um, wanted to follow up a little bit on our ELL kids. Um, 
I don't presume over time it's the same student population necessarily, right? So um, they're, they're struggling, right? So our ELL kids are struggling. I want to know, I mean, all kids are struggling, but this is really showing up here. Um, and I know a few years ago, pre-pandemic, we were really, you know, newcomer academy. We had a bilingual education program at McKinley and, you know, kind of fell off the wayside a little bit, elevating that subgroup. It, it might be a small portion of Fairfield, but it's an important one. Um, so what are we doing? I, it's always frustrating me that we give basically a literacy test in English to ELL students. <laughs> And I've always asked, you know, is there any way to give some of these um, in another language, especially for math, right? Um, because it's really a literacy test built into a math test. And I'm always curious to know how they would do if it was actually in their home language, to be honest with you, in terms of is it really math we're testing here or is it the literacy piece? But if you could just give me an idea of where we're focusing on with that group right now. So our identified students for our, our multi-language learner identified students, depending on their Lost Links score, which uh, Lost Links is the test um, that Ms. Jacobson is uh, referring to, um, that they take based on their level, they do get specific services from a English language learner teacher, essentially a TESOL certified teacher. Um, depending on how high or low they score, they get more or more or fewer services from them. Uh, there's different models that are used there. Um, you might hear the uh, SIOP protocol, for exam example, sheltered instruction observation protocol. Um, but we fully agree as a team, and I know the district uh, and building administrators as well um, have concerns over that subpopulation um, in the district and how to accelerate their learning uh, beyond the grade level at a time. Um, I assume that'll be built in somehow to the DIP. I mean, I don't want to jump forward to your going forward, Mr. Rasmussen, if you're going to be actually going over those slides, or do you want us to just jump forward? I have no problem with j jumping forward, but ultimately we do have, again, the same message related to some of the PSAT data, kind of showing you the, the achievement gaps. I did want to highlight, again, showing this, what's the story. Not, at, not just as at a particular grade level, but also across all, our entire system um, in terms of kind of setting up those. So I, as we, we continue to highlight those, that really the kind of going at to us where these opportunity gaps are, are persisting and, and existing. Um, so this is really uh, some more information related to, like as um, Mr. Cummings uh, kind of indicated, to some of the meetings that we've been having with um, each of the uh, school improvement teams at each of the building going to kind of really, really focusing on uh, in terms of how we linking that, what I call the qualitative data to the quantitative data. How is, how, how is the instruction that we're, that we're seeing in the classroom matching in terms of um, um, the, the, the quantitative uh, student achievement results? Um, so ultimately, I, I, I'm going to, I could open it up to you in terms of any specific questions related to these adult actions to the rest of the team. If I, if I can, I just want to add uh, one comment to Ms. Jacobson's question about the EL uh, student needs. I do think that um, as we go forward, the district needs to consider, it's currently our EL owner, uh, leadership is vested in our um, um, K-5, pre-K-5, and our 612 ELA program directors. And I think that there's, uh, we have to look at uh, means within the district of um, centralizing that with one person uh, as part of the responsibilities for literacy. Because I think that it, we really have to think of it as a pre-K-12 continuum um, particularly given the transitions that occurred for those students in, at the school system at any point, um, and really building that as part of our core literacy instruction and, and bringing the EL uh, educators, the certified teachers, uh, really within the wings of the uh, LASs and the, um, the literacy coaches who are in the school systems at both elementary and middle. Any follow up, Ms. Jacobson? You're shaking your head. Yeah, no, no, I think that, yeah, yeah. You can, um, just we wanted to get questions on this piece, but you can move forward the presentation, because Dr. Rasmussen, if you want to uh, go through this slide, and then we can take questions afterwards. Yeah, one, one of the key aspects here, I mean, I, what, what I continue to emphasize is this is not an exhaustive list. I, mean, I try to kind of put some of the big ideas that really come out of some of the things that are going on in the district, 
One being, like I said earlier on, the, on this prior slide, related to some of uh, the SIP work, the continued um, of our tier one data reviews, get, and specifically in the schools, and as, as the teachers um, and the various data teams get into this data. Um, and from this, similarly here is, um, is, is our continued work and district commitment to SRBI on, or, or what they sometimes refer to as MTSS or multi-tiered uh, system of support. Um, we're working with uh, uh, CES um, and, and continuing this work to, uh, to improve um, our structures and systems um, as this really kind of goes at a lot of the different things related to, to equity and also kind of looking at uh, some of our different reading placements um, um, at the high school um, and also at the middle school. And one of the things that we also heard uh, throughout when we were meeting with um, the, especially the elementary schools is really the, um, whether they're, they're seeing a lot of difference related to some, a lot of the phonics work and the units, um, um, especially in grade two. Um, and th this also then goes into our continued work and not only in just in math and, and in English, but also goes into a lot of the, even the science in terms of how do we, how do we better make sure that our units are aligned uh, uh, to the standards, um, and which then continues even towards into uh, special education of, um, I know J Jonathan Goodison is really kind of really kind of spearheaded this and really working hard on this as our, our standards-based IEPs, um, so looking at, at the middle school level. So a lot of things going on within our district that really kind of get at and supporting our moving forward to, 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 to close that achievement, and, but also that opportunity gap. Um, but we have many next steps. Um, uh, we, we have a commitment to our, our, our district improvement plan, um, our continued work um, and, in terms of our uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity, and really can, can our continued work and emphasis on improving um, our SRBI within the elementary schools, middle schools, and also the high schools. This, this has continued to be a, a system-wide approach. Because one of the things that we, we've seen in the research that or what they refer to as RTI, response to intervention, it, it is a highly effective research-based strategy that really impacts and also improves the learning of all our students. So any questions related to uh, the, the, our current actions and next steps, um, i turn it back to you. Before you do, I have to jump in again. Um, I, I want to just thank the board because as we did these, um, these mid-year meetings with the, well, the schools, but um, the board support of the SIBI's uh, coordinator positions at the three middle schools. Uh, I think that if you, if the middle school principals were with us tonight, um, what they each of them said independently in their meetings is that has been, and they've been saying this all year, that that has been a game changer in their schools this year. The ability of one staff member to be able to meet with each of the teams um, I, on grade level to work directly with those teams to identify where student needs are to coach into the strategies that are necessary um, to raise student achievement, to identify the groups of students that we require some additional supports. Um, coupling that with the schedule going forward um, and essentially allowing more time within those classes for those supports to take pla place in those classes with the additional interventionists that's in the proposed 22-23 budget, um, I think you're gonna see a, a dramatic change for the better in the middle schools. There's, um, as you know, we have um, strong administrative teams there and, and those positions that you've supported are really changing um, the face of middle school instruction for all for the better. So I just, I just wanted to say thank you for that because it's, it's making a difference. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Um, Ms. Nassikanelli, did you have your hand up for a question? Um, I must have blinked for a second, but Dr. Rasmussen, the last thing you were saying, blank is a highly effective strategy that is changing everything, and I missed what the strategy was. <laughs> it's actually referred to as, a, as response to intervention, what the state of Connecticut refers to as uh, SRBI. Um, so that is actually... Which, I, I, obviously, I'm familiar with that, so I, I thought I missed something more specific, because that's just the vague... Term. That, is there something that where... actually comes out of uh, with a John Hattie's work in terms of what are the different research based uh, strategies that actually impact student learning, which that is one of the high, most highly impactful strategies um, that really improves student learning. Miss Kelly. Hi, 
I can't yet decide if this is a statement or a question, so bear with me on how it comes out. Um, I feel like when we got the presentation about the after school uh, mentoring program that the grant money was being used for, um, again, I was surprised because it wasn't exactly what I thought it was because I do think it, it was originally presented as we were, it was, it was supposed to address learning loss. Specific, I thought it was gonna be more specific. Turned out to be something a little bit different and kind of morphed in its way into something else. Still sounds wonderful, but I did walk away from the table a little concerned that we still weren't addressing all the targeted learning loss that we were given grant money to do. And I feel like we're, you know, uh, Mr. Cummings had just said, he admitted that we're not really doing a good job at accelerating growth regularly. We weren't doing a good job doing that before. And so now we, ha we know that's an existing problem. We compound that with the learning loss from COVID. And I just can't help but wonder if we are not properly using the grant money to really throw at this problem. I'm worried, I'm genuinely concerned that at the end of three years when this money is gone, we're gonna look back and say, I don't think we addressed the learning loss the way we were supposed to, the targeted learning loss. The summer boost sounds wonderful. I know, you know, to, I share Ms. Max and Kennelly's concern that I would really like to see some more meat as far as how are we really targeting this learning loss as opposed to, I know we had to, we had really had to throw something together relatively quickly for the last summer, but I just, I have genuine concerns that we're not, I mean, to me, I feel like waiting for people to come after school, I know you're doing tier one and tier two and other interventions during the day, but waiting for people to come after school, waiting for people to maybe come in the summer if they're invited and they can make it work. I feel like I've said it before in an email and I know it sounds pedestrian on my part and it could be ridiculous, but like we pull kids out of math for band lessons and if we have to pull kids out of band for math, then that's what we should be doing. I genuinely believe that. I feel like we have to get to these kids while they're in school. I don't know how much money it's gonna take to throw at it, but we have grant money that we should be using. And I would really hate, I, gen I really hope I'm wrong, but at the end of three years when this money is gone, I feel like we're, we're not gonna have addressed the learning loss the way that I feel like we should be. I don't know what the whole answer is. Obviously, I have to defer to the experts, but right now I just, I feel like we're acknowledging the learning loss. We're looking at the data that's confirming the learning loss, but it just the actionable items, I feel like, are what's missing. And it's, we're, I feel like the runway is getting much shorter on this money, and I feel like, I don't know. So again, not a question, maybe a statement. I'm just genuinely concerned. I'm genuinely concerned. I, Ms. Kelly, I know it's not a question, but I feel compelled to respond. Um, and it's really not a, not a response so much, I think, uh, to your non-question. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, think you're, I think you have a right, I think that's a right to be concerned, and I think we share that concern, right? Um, you know, based on our conversations with the secondary principals um, prior to the presentation that the board received around the after-school programs, um, prior to the conversations around the summer boost program, what the, what the teachers and administrators have recognized that the root issues around this learning loss are, um, are issues around student engagement and students being involved with school, feeling connected to school, certainly made far worse by the pandemic. And as we've done these, um, these meetings with the, the schools and we've looked at the attendance data as well, the schools are very clear that they are, um, um, while there's some, general statements you can make why, why attendance is a challenge this year, uh, and, and some of those will be cleared up hopefully by, um, you know, the, the ending of, or at least coming to terms with what the COVID is, and people being able to travel again, and, and uh, those types of things. At its root issue, we have a, a great deal of mental health concerns in the district that, um, that really require us to engage one by one, find individual solutions almost with kids. And while the after-school programs and the summer boost program are not, um, are not sufficient to cover all of those, they do address a lot of those issues. So, um, I, so I think that that's part of the solution. 
The real core issue is, um, and, and uh, you'll see this in the district improvement plan, and, and uh, you know, as long as I've been in the district, we've been talking about it, is that um, the, rural, the root um, work is in the um, improvement of core instruction in the classrooms. How people do grouping strategies rather than teach to the middle, rather than teach to the whole class for the, for the length of the period. Um, formative assessments to identify how students should be broken up into small groups, whether for acceleration or remediation. Those are the types of things that um, are going to, we have to grind it out, but that's what's going to have to happen. And, and again, I, I think, I, I do share that concern that you have, um, but I think we have to approach this in a number of different ways, including just in, in not limiting ourselves to the after school program. And I, I appreciate your suggestion about taking kids out of band uh, for math. Yes. That was an example. But I'm I, know, saying, I know, I know that's what we do. But, right, so right. It, we will not hear an argument here. <laughs> I just wanted to share that one of the things we were conscious about with the grant money is creating funding cliffs in terms of like creating new positions that were funded specifically by the grant. Um, so with the funding of the additional interventionists through the board budget that was presented, I think that that will help again increase the number of not just put pullouts but also push-ins, push-in opportunities for those interventionists to get into the classroom supporting not only the classroom teacher but the groups of kids within the classroom. Um, I think that that will definitely be uh, of great benefit to the students that are in need of those interventions that do not necessarily come to the after school program or do not opt to come to a summer program. So I think looking at um, exploring those opportunities, but also how that intervention team can su support development and strengthening of our tier one instruction. Um, are they able to provide teachers with, you know, strategies in terms of being able to support different groups of kids? I know that looking at Tier 1 instruction is going to be, is not only a focus for this year, but an ongoing focus for our administrators moving into next year and really looking at different strategies, especially small group instruction, which has been proven to be effective at the elementary level in terms of how that can be implemented and utilized at the middle level. Totally understand not wanting to, none of us at this table want to create a cliff, none of us. Um, but I feel like I don't, I don't understand why I look at this more, this is an ongoing problem. This problem doesn't go away when COVID goes away. Obviously, I understand that. But I also don't understand, in my mind, I'm looking at all of this, especially with the grant money, from that perspective, this is triage. Like, we are trying to fix like this is like an immediate triage setting up the tent outside the emergency area and getting done what we need to get done and i feel like i understand not wanting to add headcount all that stuff but i'm i'm i guess and again all of my views are pedestrian because i don't sit on your side of the table but i just i'm i'm failing to see why this can't be addressed with you know possibly temporary contract employees, knowing that it's only a, this is a two year now. And at the end of the two years, the problem doesn't go away. We're still going to have to have these, but hopefully we have addressed a decent chunk of that learning loss that we wouldn't need as many heads or whatever it would cost to do now. And I feel like it's that sense of urgency of like, we need to, there will, we'll always have to work on this, but I just feel like there's no sense of urgency. I'm hearing district improvement plan. Okay, it's not even done. And, you know, I think we can all admit we've looked at prior district improvement plans, and we can all admit that not everything gets done on the district improvement plan. So in theory, it is wonderful, and I'm hopeful at, that that will happen. But we can't keep saying, well, it's in the district improvement plan. I, hope is not a strategy, is what I'm basically getting at. And I just feel like, again, we have this grant money. We should be, normally I'm saying, it's never helpful to throw money at, at the problem, but we are, have money for a specific problem. And I think summer boost and interventions are fine, but I think, it's t I think we need to get a little more creative with our solutions, but that could just be me. Because again, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm just concerned. No, and, and I, I think that um, I, here's where I would push back on you. I don't think we're relying on hope. I, I think that we, 
you know, I, I feel very confident speaking for everybody in the school system that there is an urgency uh, to solve these issues. Um, the, I, we did look at the idea of um, hiring additional staff. You know, and I, and I don't, I, I hope this is not perceived as an excuse by any means, but we can't hire the staff we have now. We, we're, we're, you know, we're understaffed right now by existing budgeted positions. Um, people aren't there to do this work. So we really are reliant on the bookends of the day before and after school and the summer programs to use existing staff. We struggled last year to staff within because people were at a level of being burned out. I think we're gonna be better off this summer um, but we, we just don't have the qualified people to put into those positions to, to make that difference that you're asking for. And I, it's a fair ask. Um, but I just want you to know that nobody's, nobody's waiting for a district. We're not, we've already, the district improvement plan in many ways captures what's already started to happen, right? And there's a lot of things that are happening that are, aren't really part of our school improvement or district improvement plan at the beginning of the year because we continue to modify as the year goes on. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Um, Ms. Jacobson? I'm um, just to piggybacking on some of that. So I, when I went through this and I watched your video, listened to your video, um, and went through this, and then thank you the, for the supplemental information as well, um, I felt like, well, I know where we were. I know where we are. But I was left with, besides the, these slides about what we're doing about it, where are we going? So I almost felt like when I was looking at each of these charts, there was a missing column that said target, right? So what is the non-high need student group target? What is, what is the administration and the executive board or the executive directors feel like? How are we gonna lift A, the whole ship? And what is the whole ship's target? What is the target for each of these subgroup populations in order to reach the whole ship target? So. There's a map, but I don't have a destination. And what I'm looking for in the district improvement plan, which I'm sure everyone is working very diligently on to bring back before the board, are those SMARTY goals, the columns on each end of these columns that tells me what you expect Fairfield to reach in the next five years with interim benchmarks every year along the way, probably biannually, in terms of are we on target to meet that fifth year target goal. I know what the state goals are for us, Right, 75% proficient, 100% growth, right? Theory being everyone reaches growth, you eventually reach proficiency, right? I don't think 75% is high enough for us, right? I mean, we already have groups that are above that. So I'm looking for that vision, right, from the committee and from you guys to say, you know, what can we really achieve in the next five years when that comes out? not to discount the urgent nature of what we should be doing right now and for the rest of the school year and the summer, um, but this is a bigger conversation for the board to have of what, quantitatively, literally quantitatively, um, which wraps itself around qualitative <laughs> components, um, what's our destination? So that's, that's what I don't have in here is, and I'm hoping that that's because that is being done at DIP. That is uh, accurate, the equity team, and I know the academic team as well worked on um, both raising the bar and closing the gap um, goals uh, up to 2027 with the actual percent and numbers, as you said, benchmark by year of how to get there. Uh, I don't have them in front of me, but it is um, within there. The uh, one per year suggestion as well, the last meeting that we're um, still adding is the science one. Um, but the smarter balanced and the SAT ones are in there. And again, it's in terms of all students raising the bar, but our subgroup populations closing the gap at a, a increased rate of what the raising the bar is. So it's coming. Um, any other questions? Ms. Rotelli. Yeah, I don't, this isn't really a question either. It's just more of a comment. Um, overall, when I'm looking at the presentation, and listening to everything, I just, I wonder if it's appropriate when we're breaking them into subgroups and comparing them, and I'm specifically talking about SPED, the SPED population, is it appropriate? 
because really as I'm thinking about it and approaching it from a SPED parent, you know, all of these, there's such a large umbrella of who is encompassed in SPED and, and you know, whether 504 or an IEP, it is appropriately an individualized education plan. And in my mind, when I hear stuff like accelerated goals and we need to accelerate things to get everybody to where they need to be, but for those kids, their teams are determining where they should be and is it not more appropriate to for their teams to be looking at where they were and where they are, and maybe that's a lot of progress for that individual child, than to be judging them and grouping them in a category compared to their um, same age peers based on a grade level that they probably or may never get to that grade level, and that's appropriate for them. Because um, to me, this is, you know, and, and again, there's so many different kids falling into so many different categories, yet we're grouping them into just one SPED category. And so I look at this and go, well, how can we really judge where these kids should be and how appropriate or how fast or accelerated we want things to be? Because, you know, as a parent in those meetings, you're not always getting you know, you're not, you're not gonna hear that you are approaching grade level or getting anywhere near grade level, but your child may have gotten tremendous progress in that year from where they were a year before or two years before, just based on their individualized, unique needs. So that's my problem with this. I don't know how to capture that. I really couldn't even begin. I just don't know that it's fair to compare like the nuance of that one category compared to everything else. And then I just wonder, when we're looking at the breakdowns and it's you know, broken down by race and then SPED, are those SPED numbers and obviously encompassing, uh, uh, encompassing every race, or are the individualized race numbers also included the sp their SPED numbers in those race numbers too? So they're being counted in the overall race numbers and then in their own separate column? Yes, that is correct. Uh, I mean, when you're looking at the subcategories, you're only looking at the, that specific one category and not like a breakdown of the breakdown. So it, it is specifically, say for example, those are just the special education students. Over, I mean, kind of how are they doing just in general? And then each subcategory in, in comparison to their own. So it's not, you're not, you're not intermixing between. Hi, Rob Mancusi, Executive Director of Special Education and Special Programs. Um, Mrs. Ortelli, your comments are uh, appreciated and very well taken. <laughs> However, on the other side of that, I personally, obviously, when you look at the results of special education in totality against all students and against um, you know all the data that Dr. Rasmussen presented, it does present some areas of concern. But I do think one of the things that we are doing, because many of those students, and and, and part of the reason why we um, you know proposed the development of the Early Literacy Academy was there are a large number of students who are. Um, in general ed settings, most of the day, over 80% certainly, that um, you know, this gives us an opportunity to you know, pair up with general education. And Mr. Cummins talked about mindsets. Um, what we work really hard on in, in special education is for, you know, we, 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 our mantra is that all of our students are general education students first who need specialized instruction. So it gives us the opportunity to pair up with our general education colleagues to build that tier one capacity to include students and to provide access to students with disabilities to a greater extent in, in general ed classrooms. So I, I truly appreciate the comments. Um, it, it does make you cringe um, when you look at the data in totality, but it does present opportunities um, you know, to not only look at 
the types of services and service delivery that we're providing to students with disabilities, but how we're doing it in what settings and the involvement of you know, general ed staff. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Jacobson, sorry, previous slide, um, really quickly. Um, I just wanna know, talk about um, really quickly attendance and that some of this data tracks with our, some of our attendance data. And so I'm just wondering, you know, an update on how that's going with some of these populations. What are some of the challenges we're still facing? Because I still feel like we just have too many kids not coming to school enough. So if we could just get a quick update on, I understand last year and, you know, COVID and, and the concerns there, but how are we making sure that that number is getting pretty down close to zero? So the, the schools are utilizing um, informate data from Infinite Campus to track the attendance overall by grade level, by subgroup. Um, a lot of what we've, we've heard from schools during our listening tour, during our school improvement um, plan reviews is that students are being kept home for the reasons we're telling them to, to stay home. You know, during the course of this year, if, if students are not feeling well, um, their parents are keeping them home, you know, which is what we've, we have asked them to do over the course of the year. Um, but also in addition to that, we've, we've heard from a lot of schools that there are, are some students who have school avoidance issues. Um, and so they've had teams that, you know, where the, the principal has gone to the house to try, you know, with the, the support of the parents to engage the child to come back to school. Um, so they're, they're doing home visits on a regular basis, their teams are. Um, they've also noticed that because a lot of the travel restrictions and a lot of the, um, the rates have gone down, um, families are choosing to take vacations that they didn't necessarily take previously. Um, and so they are, we are seeing in certain pockets um, of the community where there are families that have taken off for a week or a, a very long weekend uh, during the course of the school year. And so while it's strongly discouraged by the building principal and their, their, their leadership teams, families are making a choice to do this just based on the fact that for some of them, they haven't seen family in two years. Um, it is something, again, our, our, our buildings are constantly looking at and monitoring, and, and they have a pulse on you know, where those kids are and who they are and what their stories are, because I think there's always a story behind the number. Um, and so they're making a point to get to know exactly what that story is and try to figure out ways in which they can re-engage that child, re-engage that family with the sort of support of the parents and the community to get them back into school. But it is an ongoing challenge, and it varies from school to school, population to population. It's, it's just a challenge this year. So would you say the four days in a month is more challenging to us than the 10 days in the year? in terms of that count and how we're being counted? Because it's not, if it's a vacation issue in some instances, that would be the issue. That would tell me the answer. I, I think it's more so the chronic, the, the 10 days, or 10, the 10% rather. I think that's where the issue is as opposed to the truancy. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. I just have a couple. Um, Ms. Martabine, then you're up there. I'm curious just in terms of um, you know, you're looking at it through an equity lens and some of the training that you've been doing with staff and looking at this numbers, if you, what your take it is on it, being that you're looking at it from maybe a different perspective. So part of the conversation is around the whys and, and identifying the mindsets that we have to do training around so that we could be able to broaden that scope of culturally responsive pedagogy that is going into the classroom so that it could actually address the students in a way that they're seeing themselves in the classroom, they're seeing themselves in, in, in the work that they're doing, and bringing in the perspectives and the assets that they do have to the table so that it's being taken into consideration as they're navigating with the content that is being addressed. So right now there are a lot of more questions than answers so that we could be able to provide professional development across the board. Thank you. Um, and also just in terms of engagement, I mean, I think that 
you know, these last two years, families are tired, parents um, are tired, um, just, you know, keeping kids healthy, getting them to school. We've heard from students that even just transitioning this year, being back five days um, a week, just has been an adjustment. I am, um, you know, I'm wondering in terms of next steps now that our schools are more open and parents are able to visit the buildings, if there's been any communication of each of the individual buildings, building principals, just to share the school improvement plans, you know, moving forward. Um, you know, we're looking at this at a district level. I imagine there's some differences by building. Um, and I think it might be, if it's not already being done, it might be an opportunity for principals just to re-engage with the parent community, just to, to hear, um, you know, what the priorities are, what the challenges are, um, and you know, move past, move past the crisis and the trauma of the last two years. So, um, you know, I shared some of the same questions as Ms. Jacobson: is you know, what's the target? Um, I understand to the point that it does feel like we are in triage, but really um, having that target number and communicating it out to parents to have them be partners in this, I think, is an important next step. Um, and I know that community engagement will be part of the district improvement plan, but I think we could even take it down to the building level. Um, I thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm going to ask for a follow-up this school year to address Ms. Guernsey's questions about ninth grade, um, even if it's a short update at one of our upcoming meetings. Or, uh, you know, if we have a special meeting, maybe we can just close that loop that has been an open question for some time. Um, Okay, thank you. And as always, um, you know, as the board sits with this data, if you have any additional questions or follow-up, please just forward them to the superintendent, um, and he will forward them along to the proper executive director and just copy me so I can keep track. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, moving on. Um, established time, date and time of Fairfield Little High School and Fairfield Ward High School graduation. We recommend a motion that the Board of Education establish Tuesday, June 21st, 2022 at 6 p.m. as the date and time of graduation for Fairfield Little High School and Fairfield Ward High School. Can I have a motion? Mr. Peterson, seconded by Mr. Asa. Um, just for the public's um, information, the Board of Education, it's our responsibility to set the graduation date. This typically is done in April. Um, there has been some change in legislation that the board could have elected to set the graduation date when we set the calendar. This year, when the board was setting the calendar, um, there was a lot of uncertainty at that time as to what graduation would look like. Would it be one graduation on the same day, two, you know, two different graduations? Where would it be? Would we need to have rain dates? So we, um, you know, what kind of mitigation strategies might need to be in place? Thankfully, um, we've come a long way and we are here tonight and um, going to be setting, going back to, I guess, past precedent of having both of the graduations on the same night. But, um, Mr. Cummings, I will give it to you first and take it to the board for questions. And our head principals are here. I don't know if they want to come up and answer any questions the board might have. Um, thank you, Ms. Vitale. I, I think the recommendation of the motion that the uh, language and time date that's in the motion is what the administrators would recommend as the um, most appropriate time to hold a graduation, holding a graduation at each of the schools um, at the same time uh, and to return to the traditional format. Um, prior that we've had established prior to the pandemic. That would be our recommendation. Thank you. I'll um, take it to the board for any questions. Ms. Jacobson. I don't know if Dr. Hatzis and Mr. Hannah would like to come up to the, to the table really quickly. I just want to, you know, for benefit of the public too, um, you know, we, I know personally in the past I've been hesitant and the board has too is to go into that next week for a lot of different reasons, right? Whether that be kids going off to work, 
things that they have to do, or you know, even more importantly, sometimes those college orientations do around the country do start that week. So if you could just provide us an update as to why you felt going into the next week, because we could do it before then, um, technically speaking. So help us understand that that piece of this, if you could. Thank you very much, Greg Hatzis, um, head principal Ludlow High School. So graduation is, of course, primarily about our seniors. But uh, we've always felt that graduation also involves a much larger community. And that community includes other students who are not seniors as well as the teachers. So if we were to have the graduation ceremony on the night, uh, the earlier week, Thursday the 16th or somewhere in that time period, the whole school will be in the midst of final exams, which you know are an important part of our educational program. They're 10% of the student's grade. Um, so what we would probably lose is all the student participation. For instance, traditionally, at least at Ludlow, we've had um, the band and orchestra students playing, the underclassmen play pomp and circumstance as the students process down into the, onto the field. Um, we've also, we, we desperately need the help of the faculty. And if they've been, if they're grading, you know, what would be four exams on that, you know, before that evening, um, they won't be available to, uh, to assist us in the organization of the students. We have the students meet in homerooms ahead of time, so we would need all the homeroom teachers. Plus, we normally would have a rehearsal during the school day, well, you know, in the morning of graduation, so the students know exactly where to go and what to do. We do that, if it was on the field, we would do it on the field with the PA system, which we wouldn't be able to use because the exams are going on and we would be disruptive of the exams. So it just creates a whole lot of complications. Um, we have a ton of student volunteers, students who still need volunteer hours for their organizations. They help out during graduation, so they wouldn't be able to do it because they might be studying for exams the next day. Um, so th those are some of the reasons that uh, I can think of the top of my head. Considering this is my first graduation back at school, I'm going to have to uh, defer to Mr. Hatzis, but we've talked about it um, in great deal, and um, we feel specifically um, in addition with the senior experience and then our scholarship night that it works best to, um, to have it the following week. It might also potentially... Um, because we were using the senior experience, you know, in in a much broader sense than than we've ever had before, um, it would reduce the amount of time students have because you know we've set the date of when it starts, and that's sort of in stone because teachers have made plans around that date. So then those the hours that they would have to complete those experiences would also be shortened by the fact that they're graduating earlier than what the the last day of school. Any other questions, Ms. Maxson-Canelli? Uh, just out of curiosity, um, based on the ceremonies we've had the past few years, has that impacted what we're offering this year? Um, big screens, different, you know, any, any of the arrangements that we've learned from, you know, that this actually could tangibly improve our ceremonies? There, there are definitely cultural aspects that I think, you know, the ad adaptations that we had to make, you know, at the beach, um, for instance, um, just to give you a small example, you know, because our faculty really couldn't be involved in the ceremonies at the beach because of you know distancing and the numbers of people we could gather in one place, you know, they all lined up as the students were driving in, um, which we we heard a lot of great feedback on how powerful that was. So we're going to replicate that in a little way that instead of the faculty just processing and sitting down in front of the students, that they're all going to line up and have the students process by them to be able to greet some of the students that they've made connections with, and and that way the kids get to see all of their teachers that they've had over four years all at once. So it's a it's a small change, but it I think an impactful one in terms of that emotional piece. Um, we, we honestly looked into the possibility of maybe bringing the screens to, to the graduation, um, but financially it just seemed like it would be an inappropriate ask to, um, you know, to, to move forward. Um, although it brings a sense of uh, closeness, um, at the same time, what we know is that we've done this ceremony for many years, and um, you know, I, think, I think people are gonna be really excited about it, and it's gonna feel really, like old times, but at the same time with a few new twists that will, that will enhance it. And at Fairfield Ward High School, we're moving our graduation to the football field. So um, we're looking forward to that opportunity to offer more tickets for our families, similar to the amount of tickets of uh, Ludlow families. And we're looking forward to a, to a great night. Mr. Peterson? Ms. Jacobson. 
Um, just for those who may be watching, we don't, we're not talking about the location. That's not our purview, really. Um, as far as I know, we're not talking about that. <laughs> no. Uh, we are, okay. The board's purview is just to set the graduation date. Um, the planning of graduation falls to administration, um, but being that we have them here, I'm sure that we just wanted to hear. Um, it's exciting time. It's definitely, I know for the board, participating in graduation ceremonies is definitely a high point. So um, hearing about it just kind of gets us a little excited. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be, I'm looking forward to hearing Pop and Circumstance again. I must say that was a big, um, I missed it at the beach. Um, my own personal thing is great. As of the ceremonies where I think it'll be um, really wonderful to have kids back on campus. I know that a lot of board members were advocating for that last year. Um, so I'm, I'm happy they're at the place that we can bring kids back to campus. Anybody else? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Gavanna and Dr. Hatzis. Congratulations. I didn't know that you were, uh, you were done. Uh, before we go for a vote, any members of the public like to give comment on this? Okay, seeing none, take to the board for a vote that the Board of Education established Tuesday, June 21st, 2022 at 6 p.m. as the date and time of graduation for Fairfield Ludlow High School and Fairfield Ward High School. All in favor? Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Vitelli, Mr. Asa, Ms. maxson Kennelly, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly. Motion carries 8-0. Moving on, first reading of Fairfield Care's invitation to Fairfield Public School high school students to participate in discussion groups. Mr. Cummings, I don't know if you have any opening remarks on this? Uh, no, just really, well, yes, I guess, uh, briefly. Um, just to welcome Ms. Hazlitt for coming before us as representing Fairfield Care's and the uh, follow-up information that they are, she's wishing to gather on uh, what, what surveys have identified as a group of students that we're going to need to, um, to provide more support for and her efforts to um, identify what those supports may be. Ms. Haslett? Just tell um, me you have to press the button and hold it and okay. just... Uh, Good okay. evening. Kathy Hazlett, Program Director of Fairfield Cares Community Coalition. Um, yes, we'd like to do some discussion groups with students to dive a little deeper into the... Um, substance use prevention data that we got from the developmental relationship survey that was administered in April of, of 2021. Um, that particular survey was just gave us essentially four data points, the core measures, and to really assess and know more and learn more about youth substance use as well as mental health. Um, it's important to have conversations with youth and do it in a structured way. So um, I've been working with a, a small committee of folks from Ward and Ludlow High School, and uh, we'd like to have, we'd love to have um, four to six discussion groups over a period of time. Not all of that's going to happen by the end of the school year, I realize, but if there's a way that we could even continue maybe into the fall, that would be really helpful. Um, take to the board for questions. Mr. Peterson. Hi, thank you. I, I have a couple of questions. Um, you say you're looking specifically to uh, to get these groups to discuss why youth use substances to clean how clean how COVID has affected their well-being. Uh, so, are you just are you going to focus just on those topics, or is there going to be kind of a broader selection of issues that you might discuss? Uh, well, we're going to focus pretty specifically on substance use and, and mental health wellness. So what, did you have something else in mind that? No, 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 I just, I, I wanted to understand that like this is, that's the focus of this project. Um, I, I also have a question that's maybe more appropriate for, for Mr. Cummings. I, I think I understand why Fairfield Cares would like to have these off campus, but it seems a little unusual. Um, and I was wondering from a permissioning standpoint, I know, I know we're going to be looping parents into these discussions, obviously, but to, to have these kind of in an off-site location, is, is everything is going to pass muster in terms of permissions with that? Yeah, Ms. Ms. Hazlitt um, made that suggestion, um, and I don't know if you want to speak to it, Kathy. Yeah, I think it was just um, 
to give students a little bit more um, an anonymity, you know, that and more freedom to speak. So if they were talk meeting at school, they might not feel quite as willing to open up. No, and I, I understand that. I assume yeah. that that was the the yeah. course behind it. Um, it's just it, it's unusual from that regard. It, it is. It, we it kind of it certainly breaks with past tradition, but. Um, given the concerns that she raised around um, these issues around anonymity, we thought that we, we should be able to support that and think about alternate sites that would be supportive of the students and provide them that level of comfort. Right. That, I understand. Thanks very much. Ms. Massacanelli, followed by Mr. Asa. Um, just one quick question. I, and I feel strongly enough about this that I would almost make me vote against this symbolically, which I'm sure is going to pass, if there is not a discussion of social media with our youth. If we have a conversation about mental health and don't address that, I think that is, it, it is not meaningless, but it is so in, ignoring a root cause for a lot of children, and I don't see it mentioned here in this letter. Um, so that, I would want to see before I vote on this, how that is going to be brought up, because I think it is that important. Um, it's absolutely devastating to our children academically, socially, and emotionally. And I, it's, it is beyond a three-headed hydra. Um, it is that virulent and um, insidious in terms of its effect on our children. So I would put out there, I would hope to see before our next meeting what Fairfield Cares can do to add to this. Because I, I think this could be a, a, an incredibly valuable co conversation, and I know how hard Fairfield Cares works, and I very much respect the work that you do. Um, but I just believe that passionately, that social media has to be part of this conversation. No, I totally agree with you. Um, I think it's an issue of time, because we wanted to keep the conversation limited to an hour. There's lots we could talk about. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, so that's definitely something that we could consider to, to be including into our conversation. I do think, though, that would also extend the time, which is fine. So. I guess, again, this is just my views on this, and I haven't studied it to the extent I'm sure that, that all of you have. I think if you don't have that, I think the rest of the conversation is not as meaningful. Those are my views. Ms. Teresa? Um, <clears throat> with regard to the uh, gift card, um, I just want to make sure that I confirm, which I, I believe, um, that that is from grant money and is in no way tied to any budgetary line item of the Fairfield Public Schools, correct? Yes, that is grant money. Thank you for clarifying that. Ms. Jacobson. I just want to piggyback on um, one of Mr. Peterson's concern um, about off-campus. So just for many, many years and continuing on, the Fairfield Cares Youth Committee has always met off-campus and um, continues to do so as far as I'm aware. So it's it may seem unusual from what we're approving here, but um, I can tell you that the, the Youth Committee of Fairfield Cares, for as long as I've been involved, has always been an off-campus endeavor. Thank you, Ms. Jacobson. Any other questions? Um, can you just share how you would reach out to these students? So that's, I'm counting on staff to help me with that since they're the ones interacting with students. So um, we have a, a group of um, social workers and teachers who would help identify the students. And this is all voluntary. So we're hoping to get, um, it would be great to have six to 10 students participate in, in a discussion group. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, mean, I share Mrs. Massacanelli's concerns about social media. I do appreciate that Fairfield Cares is very much, um, is for, for the grant, is focused on substances. And I imagine that in your conversations, I would be shocked if social media did not come up um, in some form. But um, if not in this forum, if you think that's in terms of leaders of these discussion groups, if there's someone that's maybe more experienced with the social media aspect of it, um, I would be open to just hearing about how we could potentially grow the program if need be. Because um, I agree, it's 
Yes, it is the number one um, in terms of mental health concerns right now it's for our insidious. students, and, yeah. and has been for for um, a law. Are you mocking, are you mocking me over there? No, I'm, I'm loving insidious. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, this is the board of education. I mean. On, on that topic, I am with um, a middle school PTA about the topic of social media, and um, as well as games. Those two um, often go hand in hand. But you say gaming, as in gambling? Video games, which oh, okay. is um, also quite addictive. Okay, um, any follow-up, final questions? Okay, well, this will be um, on our next agenda for a vote. Thank you. Approval of healthy food certification. Um, can I have the, yeah, yeah, the unanimous consent of the, uh, the board just to waive the reading of these two motions? We'll start uh, recommending motion for the healthy food option. Can I have a motion to put it on the table? Mr. Asa, second by Ms. Maxson Canelli. Ms. Laborious, you can just come up and give us a, an overview. We'll start with the healthy food option first. Sure, uh, Courtney Laborious, Executive Director of Finance and Business Services. Thank you uh, for considering the healthy food certification. The recommend, recommended motion um, is to renew the healthy food certification, which provides an additional 10 cents compensation per reimbursable school lunch meal. Each year, the Board of Ed, if you, those of you that were, have been here, remember, um, is required to vote on the district's commitment to the required healthy food certification. It certifies whether the district will follow the Connecticut nutrition standards for all foods sold to students separately from our school reimbursable breakfast and lunch meals. It focuses on moderating calories, limiting fat, saturated fat, sodium and sugars, eliminating trans fats, and in general, promoting more nutrient-dense foods. It, um, in 1819, which is the last year, year I have sort of um, representative data because of the um, impact of the pandemic, it's a little hard to look. It did generate about $50,000 um, of revenue um, and also resulted in us have offering more healthy food options um, and following the guidelines for all foods, um, including those um, but not limited to school stores, vending machines, school cafeterias, and activities on school premises during all hours. And then the second amend, um, motion is to exempt after hour activities, which would still um, allow us to be eligible for that 10 cents reimbursement per meal. Okay, we'll take um, questions on the first motion. Ms. Jacobson. I just wanted to verify if the honey bun qualifies for C1. Um, because we, I'm just cure, making sure that we're not violating this by you know, maintaining that very critical option on the menu. Thank you for asking that, Ms. Jacobson. Mr. Cummings and I have had many conversations about that, and I can attest to the fact that it does, although delicious and um, potentially not the best option, we th some people think for children meet those requirements. <laughs> the whole grain honey bun. Yes. I am making sure that it falls into this category. Any, Mr. Asa? No. Mr. Peterson? Nope. Any other questions about the first motion? We'll take it. Ms. Max Canelli? Um, the free lunches that we have been offering for the past couple of years, how does that factor into this and is that continuing? So right now there is a plan to not continue that next year at the federal level. So it's called the Summer Seamless Program that we're, we've been in a waiver situation with um, for the last two years and that will discontinue as of what we know of now um, starting next school year and we'll be informing families of that soon, which means that we'll go back to a pay per meal, um, no longer um, a free lunch and breakfast. We'll take it to the public for any public comment on the first motion. Seeing none, we'll take it to the board for the vote um, that the 
Board approve the motion for a healthy food option, waiving the reading. All in favor? Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Vitale, Mr. Asa, Ms. Manson Canelli, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly. Motion carries 8 0. The second motion, recommend a motion for combined food and beverage exemptions, waive the reading. Unanimous consent. Mr. Asa puts it on the table. Mr. S Peterson seconds. Ms. Laborious gave a brief uh, discussion, uh, comment on that. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Um, if not, we'll take it to the board for questions. Oh, no, I'm okay. Thanks. Any questions? Seeing none, take it to the public. Any public comment? Seeing none, back to the board. All in favor? Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Vitale, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Maxson Canelli, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly. Motion carries 8 0. Moving on to the approval of minutes. That the Board of Education approve the March 8, 2022 special and regular meeting minutes. Mr. Peterson, second by Mr. Asa. Any discussion? Seeing none, um, take it to the board for a vote. All in favor? Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Vitale, Mr. Asa, Ms. Maxson Canelli, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly. Motion carries 8 0. I'm saying everybody's name just for the record. I don't want Mrs. Gerber to be like, you didn't, you know, get everything down. Okay, moving on to the superintendent's report. Um, before I hand the mic over to you, I, you know, I. The elephant in the room that Mr. Cummings announced his retirement, and I'm still in a state of denial and just going business as usual for this meeting because you you are with us until the end of June, and um, it's business as usual. We have a lot of work to do, so I did not want to open the meeting with that, but um, I do want to congratulate you on your next chapter and I'm not saying goodbye yet, but um, just want to. Wish you luck as you as you start looking forward to leaving us. Um, <laughs> and um, and to the public, we um, the board will be retaining an executive search firm to help us. Um, with our search for our next superintendent, an RFP was posted. It's actually open. We'll open until April eighteenth. After that, the board will review, we'll be interviewing a firm, making a decision, and once that search form is in place, we'll be engaging the community to, um, to really get feedback, um, to create a leadership profile of what we're looking for on the next superintendent, and then in the coming months, the board will um, you know, be moving forward on an interview process and hoping to get somebody in place you know, by the end of this, this year hopefully early in the next school year. We will be continuing to update you as the search progresses, but that's where we are right now. We will bring in an interim superintendent, um, you know, starting definitely July 1st, but probably a little bit of overlap in June between Mr. Cummings and our interim. Um, and as more information becomes available, we'll be sharing it with you at these meetings. And with that, Mr. Cummings, um, back to work and <laughs> Here is your, um, your opportunity to give your superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Vitelli. Um, so I'm gonna have Mr. Laborious to come back up. We wanna provide the board an update on uh, planning for the 22-23 budget. Um, as you know, we are addressing, as it continues to work its way through the town bodies, um, you are aware that we are uh, looking at potential other additional costs that Ms. Laborious is prepared to speak to you about tonight as well as um, our current planning to address those concerns um, to go forward. And we do intend to bring forward to you on, on the next board meeting on May 10th, um, dependent on the um, final uh, RTM vote on the budget, um, a list of um, potential reductions to the budget to address um, what we identify as those additional costs. So, Ms. Laborious. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Um, so, since the Board of, Ed, uh, Board of Ed budget vote for a 5.42% increase on January 27th, we've reviewed the budget with the Board of Selectmen um, in early March. The Board of Selectmen voted to put forward a 4.19% increase or a $2.5 million decrease to the Board of Ed budget. That propo proposal was passed on to the Board of Finance. The superintendent, executive director team, and board leadership reviewed that budget with the Board of Finance in late March. And on March 31st, the Board of Finance voted to restore the proposed cut 
and put forward the Board of Ed proposed budget of 5.42%. Um, this went to RTM. We reviewed the budget with the RTM at a meeting last week um, and are in the process of responding to their questions, which we will share with the board. The RTM is scheduled to vote on May 2nd. The budget before them is the Board of Ed's recommended $202,491,554. Briefly, we do know a few things, as Mr. Cummings mentioned, that have changed since then, some of which, uh, most of which we've been speaking with you about, and I'll just reiterate them, that will need to be taken into consideration for the upcoming budget once um, the RTM has a finalized number and the Board of Ed's meeting in the upcoming month of May. Um, the cost of health insurance um, is estimated to be approximately $400,000, depending on what the state uh, puts forward as the rate increase. Right now, our budget is assuming a 6.5%. Um, our preliminary letter from the state mentioned 8.5%, which would be that $400,000 that is not accounted for in the budget. Um, we will know that in the next two weeks, and we'll inform the board as soon as we're made aware. Um, there are also potential legal costs associated with um, the backfilling of the human resource position, which sadly, um, Ms. Teasy's last day with us will be this Friday. Um, and um, depending on the candidate pool, um, it could require us to incur additional legal costs um, because she did have a skill set that she brought to the board that the next candidate may or may not also have. So we're mindful of that. We'll be sharing that as well with the board. Um, we are starting our interviews after the break. In addition, we'll need to account for any costs associated with the superintendent search that don't occur this year that carry into next year, as well as cost for fuel, the increased cost for fuel. Um, when we did our presented our budget in July, we assumed a rate that the town was also assuming. The town also briefed the Board of Finance that their potential impact for the new rates that they're looking at for fuel possibly for the upcoming year would be about $140,000 impact on their side. The Board of Finance did not um, provide that funding in the budget, so the town will, similar to us, have to find that within their budget. Um, we just preliminarily looked at it, and just on the transportation side, for diesel and unleaded, it would be about an $86,000 impact. Um, and again, we'll provide this to you in a spreadsheet format when we go over, so I apologize for stating numbers out loud, but just for a broad sense. And the things we're watching that could accommodate those needs are retirements. We've had, um, in a year of unprecedented times with so many other things, a significant number of our staff have retired, much more than we projected in the budget. We have a projection of 19, and that's based on a data assessment done by the HR team, the finance team, and also uh, Mr. Rasmussen. And um, we look at um, some data to come up with that number. We projected 19. So far, we have about 24. So that yields us an additional $220,000 that was not in planned for in the budget of savings. And we could see additional retirements between now and in the next month or two. Um, if, just to give an example, if we have 10 additional retirements, that would be about $200,000 of savings against the next year's projected budget, um, next year's budget. Um, and, yep. Just just to clarify that, you said an additional 10 would yield 200,000, but you said four yielded 200,000. Can you just clarify that? Yes, okay, that's a good point. Um, so because um, the 24 that we're looking at um, for next year, there were some that retired this year, um, that when we rolled forward our budget, um, they were counted at their current salary. So for that reason, um, it's actually 24 new, but there's an additional four um, that yielded those savings that were already accounted for in the budget. Does that make sense? So when you say 10, it would really be an additional five or six to what you're factoring? Correct. So instead of 19, 29. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, and uh, follow up to yeah. that. Is that a netted number after backfill and rehiring them, or is that a gross? That is a net projected number after backfilling. We haven't backfilled and rehired them yet. Oh, you mean for the previous? Yeah, for the, so for the ones I mean, that already happened. So, if we're retiring twenty-four, you're going to fill in twenty-four. Correct. Right. So this number is the net. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
Yes. Um, in addition, um, what are the, the projected pension savings that everyone is familiar, or you might be familiar with, of about $100,925, which is the difference between the current town actuarial assessment and uh, what we have budgeted, um, which came to light after we developed the budget. And then finally, as we go into the budget um, process with the board, um, we could, and one option to consider, which was on the original um, list of potential options, is the leasing for technology. Um, there is a proposal um, for leasing some of our capital, which it looked as though it was a cut to the technology budget, but it's not. It's actually a cut to next year's budget because it would be financed over four or five years. That would require approval of all town bodies if we were to do that. So if that's an option you'd like to consider for this year, we'd have to get that in place and or it could be an option for next year um, as we look forward to the following year's budget. Um, it's for Macs, servers, and then faculty replacements for laptops. Um, and that's my update, if anybody has any questions. Questions? Ms. Jacobson. Catch the pension number. I'm really sorry. Can you repeat that? Sure. Uh, 103,000. No, I'm sorry. $100,925. Uh, $100,925. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 $100,925. With these, so these are the offsets to the, shall we say, underages, so to speak. Yes. So at the end of the day, as it looks right now, the net is we would still have some underages. Yeah, and, and all of these things, you know, have to play out in the next right. month or two. Um, but as we see it now, we could potentially have a, a, additional underages. Yes. Um, any questions? And um, it's great news about the retirements just in terms of that providing a savings, but as we saw this past fiscal year that we also ended up adding FTE at the elementary school level, so I don't know when, you know, if it's too, I'm sure it's too early to get a read on kindergarten enrollment right now, but um, just putting that out there, we that's something to consider if you have any no, we are monitoring it, and um, we can bring forward. It certainly won't be complete because we have ongoing kindergarten registration, but we can bring forward um, at the May meeting for this discussion an update on where we are with kindergarten enrollment. Ms. Mascanelli. Um, just one follow-up to Mrs. Jacobson's question. And tell me if I'm wrong, but when we talk about 24 retirements, we are not necessarily talking about 24 then hired based on our enrollment numbers, based on how the sections play out, based on how the high schools and middle schools are doing their scheduling and where the demand is for courses, there is the possibility that we are not doing a full one-to-one -one hiring replacement for 24 retirees. That's correct. It, it all the, yes, because if you look at the elementary enrollment FTE, uh, the elementary projected FTE, that, that's actually right now projected to be a decline next year. So it, uh, all, as you know, it, it all depends on the positions, yes. Um, thank you, Ms. Laborius. And to the board, I am for those listening to the RTM, I apologize for um, not putting my name in the chat box to, um, <laughs> I um, assume that we were presenting and had the floor um, to give, um, you know, my, my closing remarks, so I apologize to the board for that. I was, you know, tried to get a, get a word in edgewise, but um, as we know, they were cognizant of their meeting time as well. Um, so we'll just have to save that for, I guess, the night of the vote. So I just wanted to put that out. Sorry, I uh, fell down on the job there, guys. Um, anything else to report, Mr. Cummings? Um, I have one more thing. Um, tonight is uh, Ms. Deasy's last Board of Education meeting. We are in the final, she, um, Thursday is her last day of employment at Fairfield Public Schools. So if we had a spotlight, <laughs> we'd be shining on the back row by the door right now. Uh, but I just wanted to say, um, 
to say thank you to Ms. DC. Um, you know, for the, for the past 50 years we've worked together. Um, uh, she's she's an absolute. Um, she's been a, terrific. It's just a joy to work with, and I know that uh, the entire team uh, is going to miss um, not only her um, her good thinking, but her great sense of humor. So I just want to say thank you. I would like to reiterate that. Um, going to miss you, Ms. DC. Um, I wish you the best of luck in your next venture, and I, I hope that it's less night meetings for you so you can spend some time with your two little boys. Um, you definitely you know, saw us through a lot of changes um, and crises and negotiations, and um, we thank you for your service. And I invite any board members, if you want to give comments, I may come and see you before you leave at the end of, uh, of the week. But um, we're going to miss you. Anybody? We won't mention some of the jokes that you tell in, during um, contract negotiations. <laughs> All right, moving on to committee liaison reports. Ms. Ritelli. Hi. Uh, so SEPTA is having a meeting on um, April 27th at McKinley. It's in person this month, so um, come out and see us at 7.30. Um, we also have a provider and resource fair that will be at Fairfield Board High School from 10 to 1 on May 7th. And the SEPTA scholarship is open until April 29th. Um, applications can be handed in until then. It is open to all FPS students with an IEP or a 504, inclusive of in-district or out-of-district placed by a PBT. They're eligible and encouraged to apply, so they can look for at fairfieldsepta.org for more details and um, send applications to our transition coordinator, Mike Senzaro. Thank you, Mr. Telly. Ms. Jacobson. Um, we've had a bit of a lull at the General Assembly as things have moved on to fiscal analysis and OLR reporting. Um, just wanted to let you guys know that things are starting to pick up now in terms of you know being taken up by the House and the Senate. So I've been keeping Mr. Cummings um, and any pertinent staff aware of anything that I think that is urgent in terms of next year or just to get their insight on anything that's been coming up. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but just know that um, I'm monitoring things in terms of impact for Fairfield so or what it may mean for policy or things like that. So. Um, it's just a quick update for you guys. Ms. Maxson Canelli. Uh, as a quick follow-up to that, Ms. Jacobson, um, obviously I know you advocate individually frequently, but is there anything that rises to the level that you think the board may want to have a board unified reaction to? Um, I've been most urgently making sure that there is something that might impact our budget for next year, you know, something that has an effective date for July 1st. Um, there might be a couple smaller things that come up for that area, um, but not so much of an emergency concern, but I am watching desperately the excess cost change in formula. Um, I was hoping that the Appropriations Committee would come out with a higher bucket amount. They did not. So as that formula possibly changes, um, without additional funds, my issue was if you're going to change the reimbursement rate, that would necessarily mean we would need more money in that bucket. Um, that may not be the case. So I just want to um, follow up and make sure that there's either we will not get less than what we've budgeted <laughs> for next year or a hold harmless of some kind. Um, to plenty of time still to come. So if anyone feels compelled to get clarification or um, talk about that bucket, that's one of my things that I've been watching pretty closely. Um, there's a lot of things around you know, going forward. I think for next year, we're going to see things coming in for 23-24 um, more um, in terms of mental health, you know, looking at mental health staff, social workers, psychologists, evaluators things of that nature. Um, there's also the air quality bills have come out of committee um, in both labor and in um, public health. They're two different bills, but kind of related. So watching those and where they may go for us um, in the future. So yeah, there's, there's quite a number of things, but um, I was really making sure that Mr. Cummings was aware of anything that might impact us for the budget right now. Um, and then just going forward, those will be conversations. But um, excess cost is one of those things that I'm watching. Thank you, Ms. Jacobson. Ms. Grunzi? 
Mr. Asa. Um, so for facilities committee, uh, we will be meeting um, at the end of the month on the 27th due to spring break, um, covering the third Wednesday. Um, and just a note, as we start to discuss preliminary discussions on talking about you know 10-year facility plans, um, I have invited Mr. Went, the Director of Planning and Zoning, to our next um, meeting. And uh, a couple things that I had mentioned to him that we were curious on starting a dialogue with um, was getting his input on where P and Z for C is trying to build more affordable housing. Um, and, and how they consider the impact on the school system. Um, and also trying to get some updated numbers on um, statistics on FPS students coming out of some of the newer, larger developments and where those numbers fall and do they line up with what's projected. So looking forward, he was graciously accepted the invitation, so looking forward to that conversation. Um, and we will also be discussing some current um, maintenance projects um, and emergency, potential emergency repairs anywhere. So we'll rely on Mr. Papa George for that. Thank you, Mr. Asa, and thank you. I'm very excited that um, Mr. Went will be joining us at our next meeting. Um, we've been talking about that at the board table for some time, so it'll be good to move that forward. Just as a piggyback, um, you remind me, Malone and Slam Collaborative um, timing for our 10-year projections. I don't know if I know there was a little bit of a delay in getting that out. Um, do you think that we might get something in time for our next meeting or sometime in May? And you can say, I don't know, because I just no, put you I, on the spot there. I, I don't know, but I'll, I'll ask, uh, I'll email uh, Mr. Zuba for an update. Thank you. Ms. Max Canelli. Well, one question for that, because obviously if we want the best data for making any possible decision of examining our space utilization, don't we not want that now since we've kind of said we're not moving forward likely next year, I guess I would question why would we want those quickly? We had this discussion back in January and we thought that we'd be getting it sooner, that the board just based on the influx of residents in town just to get an idea for planning of, of you know, where we were. They're not doing the full um, you know, new plans, just giving us new updated projections. Yep. Um, two updates for me um, for policy, just to give people an idea of what we've been working on. Um, although it likely is not going to be a voting item, we will be updating the board uh, probably in June regarding where we are in our work for the grading policy, uh, which Fairfield currently does not have one at all. Uh, we're also doing a fairly significant re-examination of, and so to anyone paying attention who's involved in PTAs especially, um, taking a look at our fundraising and our gifts policies. Um, these are separate policies. Uh, we're very, very happy that uh, the leadership at PTA Council has been um, involved in those conversations and giving us some really good feedback. But when that is ready to go, uh, it will be enormously helpful for PTA leadership to take a look at them um, because we're certainly not looking to turn these into denial policies, um, but simply to give more structure to our process. Uh, and then secondly, um, in my first meeting with Parks and Rec, Nice meeting, um, great people, I enjoyed it a lot, but I also uh, subsequently went to the master plan workshop, uh, which I just encourage the town, this is not the kind of work, I mean that's true of all of the work that all town boards do, but this isn't the kind of work you wanna wake up to after they've done everything and say, wait, I had an idea, I object to this, I wish you had considered that, and just, you know, highly recommend all members of our community, not just school, but um, all members to, uh, take a look that if you just do a search on Fairfield Parks and Recreation Master Plan, uh, it has its own separate page uh, with all of the documents, all of the presentations, and just to see some of the changes that they're looking to make out there for improvements to our fields, which our schools do use, um, do access, um, as well as, of course, the pickleball courts and uh, dog um, dog parks. So it's, and those are just a few. There's a lot more to it. I just really recommend uh, that people take a few minutes just to see what they're up to to have a voice in that process. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dresa? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, so Mrs. Vitale, myself, Mrs. Laborious, and Mr. Papa George tomorrow will be attending um, the capital planning work group that we were invited to um, regarding bonding um, for the town. So uh, we'll give you an update after that. Thank you. Mr. Peterson? 
All right, I got a bunch of stuff. Um, uh, Ms. Max and Kelly with her Parks and Rec reminded me that I, I went to my first meeting of the uh, Special Project Standing Building Committee uh, earlier this month, or actually late in uh, late 28th of March. Um, they discussed the Roger Ludlow roof issue, made several uh, small uh, budgetary issues. Um, it seems like that there's there were some savings uh, that they were able to find, and the money is going to go back into contingency. So that project is working going along as planned. Um, uh, finance committee. We dealt with a lot of things in finance committee last week. Um, we got a uh, an initial, very preliminary projection of uh, kind of our third quarter, current year finances. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that the uh, advanced accelerated retirements are helping us a little bit in covering some gaps, but at the cost of not having the existing budgeted positions that we that we expected. So that's that's a two sides of the coin issue. Um, we also talked about, uh, Ms. Laboris had done some initial work, very preliminary work, on uh, examining uh, health insurance, health insurance options, whether we should move away from the state 2.0 plan and go to some uh, other, other version of plan. Westport, for example, has recently switched. Um, they realized a pretty significant savings. Um, she, Mrs. Laborious was talking, this is a very long-term process, but it, it is due. Normally, the, we would do this about every five years. It was postponed because of COVID, not really on our, on our radar, but something that um, going forward they were going to work on. And uh, she was going to get us a timeline, basically, of talking about how long this you know, might take and, and the steps that we would need to take and when we'd need to loop in, loop in the board and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and we also, uh, we would dealt with the uh, tuition for uh, students, uh, children of employees issue, where we've sent that back to policy now. So, uh, Ms. Maxson, if you haven't heard, we can we can discuss that. Um, and independently, I, I do want to say that uh, last Thursday, I also chaired a meeting uh, between, uh, basically between, uh, a summit meeting between uh, staff, central office staff, and the town purchasing department, because there had been some frictions there with various things. I felt the meeting was very productive. Uh, Fairfield Public Schools was able to ex explain a lot of its issues about why our policies are, in some cases, different, need, need different handling. Um, and I think we also heard uh, more information, detailed information from town purchasing about what they need to pass things through. So I, I think that was productive, and I just thank everyone for participating. Mr. Asa. Um, Mr. Peterson, just to just to clarify, um, and thank you for doing that work on the health insurance. Um, and just to be clear, so people and staff don't freak out, um, that this is an exploratory process that we would normally run routinely go through. It does not mean that there's any changes imminent, and we would also follow any collective bargaining, um, you know, ramifications that. Absolutely, I, I tried to make this clear in the meeting itself that this is extremely pl preliminary, really just an idea at this point of a thing that we could consider in the future, but it, only at the at the very germ of an idea of a beginning and not anything that we have decided on or making any definite plans for. Thank you. Nothing. Um, I forgot to mention that Ms. Rotelli and I were on the CES call um, what? I know. We, 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 we have taken up where Ms. Pitko left off. Um, and I would just wanted to share with the policy committee that they were looking for information on the Board of Education handbook. So I forwarded them our Board of Education handbook, and they were most appreciative. So um, forwarding that along. <laughs> OK, moving on. Open board comment. Ms. Guernsey. Um, yes, I had the pleasure last week to attend um, two performances at our middle schools, um, Into the Woods Junior at Woods Middle School and um, Shrek Junior at Tomlinson Middle School. And it was, um, you know, there was so much talent. It was a really um, fantastic energy to see um, live the, the students performing to live audiences, which they hadn't done in several years. So um, just really wanted to uh, congratulate them on those performances and looking forward to the high school musical performances to come. Anyone else? Ms. Max Canelli. Well, 
In case you haven't heard, I am delighted to report that Fairfield had three teams at Odyssey of the Mind uh, that finished in the top two, which means that they qualify for Worlds. Uh, so it was our team, uh, one of our elementary school teams from Burr, our Tomlinson uh, Middle School team, and our Fairfield Ward High School team. Um, so I'm very delighted. Uh, I know that at least a few of the teams, I know that the Ward, sorry? I, darn right. Um, and uh, so I'm, you know, I know at least two of the teams are actively doing some fundraising uh, to help them uh, travel to Iowa, which is where worlds are. Um, and so I'm just, you know, thrilled that this reengaged and uh, hope the, hopefully we're going to get back to growing the program uh, even more next year. When is worlds? I believe it's Memorial Day weekend. Um, I'd have to confirm that, but yeah. Okay. Um, and we'll have to get the content information and we'll hopefully invite them to our May meeting, May 10th meeting. And they always promise to be the most memorable at that meeting if I can get them to come in costume. No pressure for those lessons. No, no pressure, guys. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I would just like to you know, share with the public that for our student awards, which is held at the end of May, May 24th. The board typically has a business meeting following that award ceremony. This year we're going to have a special meeting on May 25th to conduct business. So May 24th will really just be focused on celebrating our students. Um, very often, you know, we run short on time and we, we feel the pressure to end and it's really going to be a celebration for um, you know, those receiving the superintendent's award and looking to possibly piggyback a recognition of many of our student athletes that we have not been able to invite to our board meetings this year, in part due to concerns about number of people in the room. Um, so possibly thinking about starting that at 6, and then the superintendent's award starting at 7 p.m. So just put it on your calendars, board members, and for those members of the public, um, we invite you to watch on Fair TV and attend if possible. Okay. Moving on, public comment at this point. Invite any members of the public to come forward. <laughs> the public is leaving. <laughs> All right, um, seeing no public comment, can I have a motion to adjourn? Ms. Rotelli, seconded by Ms. Jacobson. All in favor? Motion carries 8 0. We are adjourned at 9 40.